I'm here with, with Richard Suskind, um, a very accomplished author. Um, one of my favourite books that you've written is The Future of Professions. Um, I, I love this book because it challenges many preconceptions where people think robots and technology will take the lower skilled jobs. Mm. The point you're making is actually the medical profession, the legal profession, lots of professional jobs, the human experts, their jobs will now be challenged by artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, maybe you can summarize some of your, your key arguments yes. in, in, in that book that you wrote together with your, your son. Which is the reason that role was special for me. Daniel, my son, is an economist. He and I joined forces to look at a a bundle of professions. We were working, he was working at number 10 Downing Street and I was working as an author advisor and working in professional services firms. And we had the sense that the changes being brought about because of technology were not limited to one or two professions. Every profession was going through similar changes. So we thought, why don't we go out and speak to the market leaders, mm. the, the thought leaders, the, the startups, the disruptors, and find out what's going on in medicine and law and architecture and audit, tax consulting, in education, um, in journalism, and even in the clergy. So we looked at all these professions, and the broad theme we found was this, that as regards technology, there were two different phenomena coming through, two different futures. One, which we said was reassuringly familiar, was the idea that the role and impact of technology was essentially to improve what it is the professionals do today to augment, support and enhance them. And the other role we saw emerging technologies which frankly were displacing, disrupting, replacing the traditional professional model. And we saw a mixture of these, it was some quite dramatic changes, you know, in education for example, in Harvard we saw that in one year more people signed on for uh, their online courses than had attended that physical university since its foundation. In journalism, Associated Press, as long ago as 2014, were using algorithms rather than financial journalists to generate earnings reports. In tax, we saw that already more than 50 million people in the United States were using online services rather than tax advisors to submit their tax return. In law, uh, we looked at eBay every year, more than 60 million disputes, believe it or not, in eBay. Almost none of them sorted out by lawyers and judges, sorted out by something called online dispute resolution. In audit, you see this move away from what used to happen, the, the audit once a year based on a sample of financial transactions, at least to the possibility of real-time uh, audit in background, uh, working on all financial transactions in architecture, I was just point to the uh, Hamburg Concert Hall, which is a remarkable building designed mainly by uh, by algorithm. And of course, in the clergy, it was not of course, but it's a reality, we found this little app called Confession, uh, which had tools to help you track your own sin, options uh, for contrition, and even the Vatican got involved in the debate about whether or not this was suitable. So whatever profession we looked at, we're seeing some quite dramatic uses of technology. We decided to take a step back though and ask the question, why do we have the professions at all? Mm. Why is it that we give exclusive rights to certain occupational groups? Only a certain type of person is allowed to cut your body open. Only a certain type of person is allowed to appear in upper courts. Only a certain kind of person is allowed to make authoritative statements about the financial health of a business. Mm. We regulate, we authorize, we ring fence, and we call it the grand bargain. Mm. It's the grand bargain that says, we allow you to be the only people who can do X, Y, and Z. It's in the interest of the recipients, but in return, make it accessible, make it affordable, keep your knowledge current, and make sure we can trust you and that you owe a remarkable duty of good faith to those you advise. And that's been the model in the print-based industrial society. But when you look at our health systems around the world, you can see they're creaking. Mm -hmm. You look at our educational systems, likewise. You look at legal systems, we have access to justice problems. So we're not actually in the print-based industrial society, the system's creaking, and we ask the question, might there be new ways of handling the old problem? And the old problem is this, that we define what is at the heart of the professions, is this idea what we call practical expertise. And practical expertise is a mixture of textbook knowledge and everyday experience. Mm -hmm. It's what your doctor, your lawyer, your accountant has. Mm -hmm. It's this amalgam of, as it were, content that they bring to bear. Usually when you get a problem of uncertainty, 
I'm in this situation, I'm not sure how to classify or categorize it. Sure as anything, don't have the knowledge or expertise to resolve it. So you go to a human expert. And so we define this expert as, or the process of the professions really, as our current way of producing and distributing practical expertise in society. Mm -hmm. And therefore our book is asking the question, might there be different ways of producing and distributing practical expertise in society? Quite near to the end of writing the book, the title was settled and everything, the title of the book, The Future of the Professions, and our premise, we're asking the question, what's the future of the professions? We realise we're asking the wrong question. And I don't mean this as a joke, but if you ask the question, what's the future of the professions? You're assuming they have a future. A better way of framing it is to think, how in the future will we be solving problems to which the professions today are the best answer? Yeah. And that leads you not necessarily to an automated version of the professions. It liberates you to think, well, actually, in an online world, we might be able to make available practical expertise in a new way. And the promise of education for 7 billion people, healthcare for 7 billion people, 7 billion people being able to understand and enforce their entitlements, we found that very exciting. Mm, hugely exciting. And, and you see this happening already in lots of industry and healthcare and education yes. where there are hugely popular apps, yes. tools. It is very interesting though that people often say, your book's very pessimistic. And we say, it depends which way you look at it. From the point of view we accept of the traditional provider, this is indeed threatening. But we're optimistic because we can see as never before that the recipients mm -hmm. of professional services might have alternative, more affordable, less forbidding, more practical, more available ways of resolving their difficulties. So we, to this day, maintain it's an optimistic book. We are writing, I should say, uh, we're just doing a second, well, it's not quite a second edition, more an updated edition where we're revisiting what's happened over the last five years. Believe it or not, it'll be five years since we wrote that book. Incredible. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we're still seeing lots of people entering professions. Yes. We've got more accountants than ever before. People still become lawyers. They've trained to become radiologists, mm -hmm. even though machines can do this very well. What would be your recommendation for the people when they make career choices? Well, there's an interesting question here as well, I should say, of timing, that although I think great advances are possible in a small number of years, there are often cultural, regulatory obstacles that stand in the way of immediate change. So I could imagine a system that would replace auditors in a very small number of years. I don't think that's going to happen mm. uh, for a decade or more. Uh, and again, there's very strong vested interests that would press against that. So I just want to say this is not just about technical feasibility. Okay. The general advice I give to aspiring professionals is, as I always say to lawyers, it's not about practicing law in the 20s as your parents or your uncle or your next door neighbor practices law. You'll still in the future be involved in solving legal problems, but you may be involved in the design of systems that solve problems rather than one-to-one -one consultative advisory service. So that's the message to professionals. We have this view that it is a one-to-one -one engagement, but actually we foresee a more of a one-to-many relationship and that doctors, for example, can make content advice and guidance available to many people, mm -hmm. subject to all the limitations and, of course, the concerns people have over the accuracy and the robustness and so forth of these systems. But just the principle is to move away from one-to-one, -one, frankly, unaffordable service on a global basis to one-to-many, sharing that knowledge and experience more widely. And so I believe people who are coming out of uh, professional training just now should be open to the idea that they, one of their prime roles in the future will be involved directly in the design and development and implementation of systems that will replace the old ways of mm. the professions. I guess one challenge is you said that, that professions become, they, they train and become experts through practicing. Yes there's a real danger that we lose some of this human expertise that yes. we get. Do you have some concerns about that? I've always been worried, and I've written in a number of my books about the question, how do you become an expert if you haven't been through your basic training, as mm. it were? Where do you cut your teeth? Yeah. It's interesting, I, I interviewed some young lawyers about this and uh, went to visit them in a big city firm, and they were doing a huge document review exercise, and I said, 
if this was done by machine, how would you learn to do it? And to a person, they said the same thing. They said, we get this after a couple of days. We don't need to do it for a couple of years. So I often cynically say, don't confuse training with exploitation. The reality is, as long as the market's prepared to pay for young lawyers to do these major reviews, law firms are prepared to recruit and train individuals in great numbers. But I think this leads us to, in fact, one dimension of the book, which is fundamentally rethinking training. Mm -hmm. And I'm always, when I, when I look at an astronaut or images of astronauts um, for the first time stepping into their shuttle or whatever, they don't look around and say, oh, this is what it looks like. So it's funny, I didn't know what it was going to look like. Of course not. They've been working in simulators for years beforehand. And I think we need to do the same in the professions. I think we need to create simulated practice environments, huge learning environments, uh, virtual environments, in which I suspect we can expose young professionals to a far wider range of possible experiences. Mm -hmm. So it won't come as a surprise to hear that I think the solution to the problem you rightly identify mm -hmm. is technology. Mm -hmm. Now, it's some form of technology. I think our learning technology has got some way to go, mm -hmm. but I could imagine that these people can learn rather than the two days, they can learn that uh, uh, through immersion Completely. In, in everyday experience mediated through these emerging technologies. I'm not sure if people have fully grasped yet just how significant forms of virtual reality will be mm -hmm. in learning and educating uh, all of us. And it's not just professional training, it'll be lifelong learning too. I couldn't agree more. So what would you say are some the, the key takeaways that you would like people to take away from your, your book, The Future of Professions? What were the what were the top messages for you? In many ways, one of the most challenging messages, but enduring messages, to, is to think about the trades and crafts of the Middle Ages. The mercers, the cord winners, the tallow chandlers, people who worked with silk and with... Uh, leather goods and with candles. People still today want silk and leather goods and candles, but the way in which we produce and distribute them has fundamentally changed. It's no longer a craft. So what we see is we're moving away from professional service as a craft, as a bespoke service, to being increasingly standardized, systematized, and eventually commoditized form of service. So it would not surprise me at all if in a hundred years time, people look back and say, solicitor, I wonder what that's involved. Or, uh, uh, it, it, these crafts will recede. And the key point here is I don't think any of these professions are valuable in and of themselves. They're only valuable in the consequences they bring. Mm -hmm. Better education, improved health, understanding of rights and entitlements, better business. Mm -hmm. If the market can find better ways mm -hmm. of delivering the solutions that the market requires, solutions to which professions today are the best answer, it will unflinchingly, it seems to me, default to these alternatives, to these technology-based alternatives. So for those people who say for their children, you'll always be safe in the professions, I think if you're thinking of the 20th century professional practice, you've missed the point. Mm -hmm. However, it seems to me for the foreseeable future, but not for all time, uh, uh, the attention of the profession should be turned to replacing the old ways of working with advanced systems that are appropriate in a digital age. Very good. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you.